الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وجاهد في سبيل الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته الصالحين الغر الميامين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا ثم أما بعد Brothers and sisters Imam Ahmad narrates a hadith in his Musnad with a sound chain of narration that a man came to visit Sayyiduna Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam who used to serve as the judge of Damascus. The man came and went straight to Sayyiduna Abu Darda. So Sayyidina Abu Darda asked him, what has brought you here, my brother? So the man replied, a hadith which you relate from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Sayyidina Abu Darda asked him, have you come for some worldly need? In other words, you're coming from out of town. Are you coming just to listen to a hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Or are there other personal reasons why you are here for some worldly reasons? So the man said, no. So Sayyidina Abu Darda said, have you come for business? Are you here for some trade perhaps? So the man replied, no. So Sayyidina Abu Darda said, you have come only to seek this hadith, all this long distance you traveled. Just to seek this one hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So the man said, yes. And so Sayyiduna Abu Darda said to him, I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, that whoever travels a path seeking sacred knowledge, Allah will place him on a path leading to Jannah. The angels lower their wings for the student of sacred knowledge, pleased with what he's doing. The creatures in the heavens and the earth seek forgiveness for the student of sacred knowledge, even the fish in the water. The superiority of a religious scholar over a devout worshiper is like the superiority of the full moon over the other heavenly bodies. The religious scholars are the heirs of the prophets. The prophets don't leave money as a bequest, as a wasiyah. Rather, they leave knowledge. Whoever seizes it has taken a bountiful share. Brothers and sisters, there are many texts of the Qur'an and of hadith literature in which 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encouraged us to learn. Even the first revelation that was sent down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was Iqra, read, recite. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would remind his companions again and again about the great virtues of learning, in particular knowledge of this deen. And not only did he encourage them to learn the deen, but he also encouraged them to travel to learn the deen. Even in the Qur'an, we find in the story of Sayyiduna Musa and Sayyiduna Khidr السلام, in Surah Al-Kahf, that Musa السلام, once he learned that there was someone on this earth who was given knowledge that Musa alayhi salam did not have, he set out on a journey and he went by sea to go and meet this person for no other reason other than to learn from him. And this tradition of traveling to learn, traveling to seek knowledge has continued in the history of this ummah from the time of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and onwards. So we have so many stories of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ that they would travel from one place to another just to learn the deen. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu went from Medina to Egypt just for one hadith that he had not heard directly from the Prophet ﷺ, but another companion had heard it. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu went from Medina to Sham just for one hadith. Sa'id ibn Jubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu went from Kufa in Iraq all the way to Mecca just to learn the tafsir of one ayah of the Qur'an that another companion had learned from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And Hassan al-Basri, the famous Tabi'i scholar, went from Basra to Kufa, from the city of Basra to the city of Kufa, just to ask one fiqhi question from one of the Sahaba that were living in the city of Kufa. In this hadith that Sayyiduna Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrated, the Prophet sallallahu talks about traveling to seek knowledge. And we can travel literally to seek knowledge, but some of the ulama like Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali have mentioned that the reward also applies to someone who, who takes a more intangible path to seeking knowledge. And the intangible path of learning, seeking knowledge, would include attending sessions of ilm, paying attention, listening, reading, taking notes, seriously trying to absorb what is being said rather than just passively attending them as a pastime to be inspired or motivated or energized or entertained and then go back and forget what we learned a few days later. But to take an intangible path in seeking sacred knowledge would mean that one does that actively and passionately and seriously with, with intensity. When we, when we do that, when we listen, when we take notes, when we memorize, when we review our notes and so on and so forth, then we're also, inshallah, on a path, on a path to seeking knowledge of this deen. It's not a physical path that we are physically walking on, but it is an intangible path of seeking sacred knowledge. And inshallah, if we do that, then we can get this reward that the Prophet ﷺ talked about. The reward in the form of a path leading to Jannah, as he said, that whoever traverses that path, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall put him on a path that leads to Jannah. 
In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assist that person to learn the deen. Will assist that person so that the confusion that he may have or she may have about certain aspects of their deen will go away. Certain things that don't make sense to a lot of people will begin to make sense to them. Certain doubts that they have about their faith will be shattered and gone by the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then assists the person to practice what they learn and to learn more and more. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also encouraged uh, learning the deen on other occasions. For example, once it is related that he came into the musalla of his masjid sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to masjid al-Nabawi and he found there two gatherings of people, two circles of companions. One group of companions was engaged in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're gathered there for dhikr, for remembering Allah and to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a group. The other group was there studying the Qur'an and studying the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw that, he made a remark and he said, that in both of these groups there is good. In both of these groups there is good. However, he said, I was sent as a teacher. Inama bu'ithu mu'allima. I was sent as a teacher. And then he sat down with the second group that was engaged in learning and teaching and reviewing and studying the deen. It is so important, brothers and sisters, to to traverse this path of seriously, seriously learning our deen and increasing our knowledge about our deen. That Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the great scholars from the Tabi'een, he once said that after worship that is obligatory, after the fara'id worship, there is nothing better than seeking knowledge of this deen. If one does so with a good intention, desiring Allah and desiring Jannah. If one does it with the right intention, then there is nothing that is superior to that after the obligatory worship. No activism, no work, no volunteerism, no social work trumps seeking knowledge of this deed. This is the most meritorious thing that you can do after, of course, finishing your obligatory worship. As long as you do it with the right intention for the sake of Allah and for the sake, for the sake of His reward in the afterlife, for no worldly purpose or gains. In another hadith that is related by Imam Tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ once said, if you pass by the gardens of paradise, graze therein. If you pass by the gardens of Jannah, graze therein. He's using some imagery here. Just like, you know, uh, a sheep, if when it passes by a garden, it would stop and it would graze in that garden before moving on. He said, when you pass by the gardens of Jannah, don't just pass by, stop and benefit from those. So he was asked, Ya Rasulullah, what are the gardens of Jannah? And he said, Hilaqu dhikr. dhikr. The halqat of dhikr, circles of dhikr. Now, the narrator of this hadith, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the famous companion, whenever he would narrate this statement of the Prophet وسلم, he would clarify and he would say this does not mean the gatherings of storytellers this means study circles because you know there are people 
who give very nice speeches that are very inspirational and full of stories that are motivational. This hadith, according to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, is not talking about those gatherings and those sessions and those events. This is talking about study circles where people gather to study, for example, the book of Allah, tafsir of the Qur'an. Or they gather to study the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or they gather to study fiqh, the do's and don'ts of worship and transactions and marriage and divorce and so on and so forth. Where they gather together to study matters of aqidah, matters of theology and prophetology and eschatology, matters of creed, matters of belief where they gather together to study matters related to the purification of the heart, the improvement of our character, and strengthening our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so on and so forth. These are the types of gatherings that according to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the Prophet sallallahu referred to as gardens of Jannah. Gardens of Jannah. And only a fool would miss out on the gardens of Jannah of this world. You know, as Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala used to say, that there is a Jannah in this world. Whoever does not enter it shall not enter the Jannah of the hereafter. Brothers and sisters, many texts of the Prophet ﷺ encourage us to learn the deen with some seriousness and passion and intensity. And especially, especially to do that in the house of Allah. In the house of Allah, in the masjid. In one text, the Prophet ﷺ said, related by Imam Muslim in his Sahih, that whenever a group of people gather together, in a house of Allah, fi baytim min buyutillah, to recite and study the Quran, they're surrounded by angels and covered by Allah's rahmah. Tranquility descends upon them, and Allah mentions them to those who are with Him. This special tranquility and the presence of angels happens when people gather together to do this in the masajid. There's nothing wrong when, with gathering together to remember Allah, to study the deen at someone's home or at a rented office facility. There's nothing wrong with that in doing that on campus at the university. Alhamdulillah, it's all good. But there is something special. Something special when that is done in the house of Allah in the masajid, in that sacred space. The Prophet ﷺ said that those people who tread the path of knowledge, they're in the path of Allah until they return. They're in the path of Allah until they return. And therefore, as some of the ulama have mentioned, that if death comes to a student while he or she is in that state, then they die as a shaheed. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, someone comes and attends a circle, a session of knowledge at the masjid, and on the way there or on the way back, their time comes and they pass away. They're treated as a shaheed because they are in the path of Allah. On the way there and on the way back and while they are there, they are in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspire us to become students of sacred knowledge, all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspire us to have a passion for it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitate it for us to find time for it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us to tread that path. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fastaghfiruh faya fawz al الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين 
يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ثم اما بعد brothers and sisters Jabir bin Abdullah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu narrates an incident that happened with the companions and the incident is recorded by Abu Dawood in his Sunan with a chain of narration that is Hassan. He said that we set out on a journey and while we were on a journey, on the journey, a man from among, among us was injured, he was injured by a stone and it left a gash in his head. And then later on that same night, the man had a wet dream. So, when everybody woke up before Salat al-Fajr, the man explained to his companions his situation, that he has a wound on his head, and he had a wet dream. So, he needs to perform ghusl to pray, but he's afraid of infecting the wound. So he asks the companions, do you think it's permissible for me to perform tayammum in my situation? And so the companions responded to him and said, no, it's not permissible for you to do that. Because we have water with us. We have water with us. And you can only perform tayammum falam tajidu ma'an fatayammum. When you don't have access to water, and we have water. So you cannot make tayammum, you have to make ghusl. So the man listened to them and he performed ghusl. His wound was infected, he became severely ill and he died. The companions went back to the city of Medina and informed the Prophet ﷺ of what had happened. And the Prophet ﷺ became angry. And he said, قَتَلُوهُ قَتَلَهُمُ Allah. They killed him, may God destroy them. And then he said, if they didn't know, they should have asked. Because the cure for ignorance is asking. The cure for ignorance is asking. And then he explained to them that it would have been sufficient for the man to perform tayammum and place a bandage over the wound and just wipe over it and wash the rest of his body. Brothers and sisters, we learn a few things from this hadith. One thing, as, as many of our ulama have constantly reminded us, is that seeking knowledge is not optional. Seeking knowledge of our deen is not optional, it's mandatory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ If you don't have knowledge, you must ask those who have knowledge. It's not going to come to you. You have to seek it. You have to go and learn and find out and ask questions. The Prophet ﷺ said, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ That seeking knowledge is a fard, is an obligation on every Muslim male and female. There are aspects of our deen that is individually obligatory upon all of us to learn. There are aspects of our deen that every single Muslim must learn. Fard ayn, how to pray, how to fast, how to give zakat, if you have earnings and savings, how to perform hajj, if it's become an obligation upon you. Certain matters, do's and don'ts of commercial transactions. If you invest in cryptocurrencies, you must know whether it's permissible or not. And so on and so forth. These things are fard, ayn, for us to learn. And then there are other things, other aspects of our deen that are fard kifaya. Not every Muslim has to learn them. But enough people in the Muslim community must be well versed with those things so that they can benefit the rest of the people that don't know. So brothers and sisters, there are some things that are essential for all of us to learn. How to pray, how to fast, how to purify ourselves, how to perform wudu, how to perform ghusl, and so on and so forth. Ibn Mubarak, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the great tabi'i scholars, he said, he was asked, 
What is required for a person to learn from this deen? What is required for every person to learn? And his reply was that one cannot embark on any action without knowing its permissibility. And if one doesn't know, then he has to ask or she has to ask. And because of this, brothers and sisters, scholars like Ishaq ibn Rahway and many others, they even said that if one does not know the basics of their deen, then, and the only way that they can learn is by traveling out of town, then they must travel out of town and they don't even have to seek the permission of their parents. They don't even need the permission of their parents to go and learn what is fard ayn for them to learn if that's the only way that they can do that. Another thing, brothers and sisters, that's very important that we learn from this hadith of Sayyidina Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu is when the Prophet ﷺ was informed of that, he made some remarks and among what he said was that the cure for ignorance is asking. So he called ignorance a disease, which tells us that ignorance is a disease of the heart. Ignorance is a disease of the heart. Not knowing is a disease of the heart. And you all know the importance of fixing the heart. If the heart is not fixed, the actions cannot be fixed. And brothers and sisters, we have a crisis of knowledge among Muslims today, among Muslim activists today. In Islam, brothers and sisters, knowledge, religious knowledge, is a prerequisite for activism. It's a prerequisite for activism. Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala has a chapter in his Sahih that is called Babul Ilmi Qabla al-Amal. The chapter of learning before acting. We don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with ignorance. We must learn before we act. We must learn before we worship. We must learn before we become active. The Prophet ﷺ talked about the danger of not doing that when he talked about the end of times. And he said that towards the end of times, there will come a time when there will be many people who will be great speakers, but very few who are true scholars. And he said at that time, knowledge will be better than action. Knowledge will be better than action. You know, brothers and sisters, those of us who get involved in social activism, those of us who get involved in volunteerism, those of us who get involved in interfaith dialogues and activities, and we don't fulfill the prerequisite of learning the deen before we do those things or as we do those things, then there are consequences of that. One of the consequences is that we compromise on the wrong issues. Well, we can make certain compromises in da'wah, but not on every issue. There are certain red lines that cannot be crossed. And if we don't have grounding in our deen, then we begin to compromise on the wrong issues. We will mistake truth as falsehood and falsehood as truth. We will misplace our priorities. There are things that are more important and things that are less important. And we will misplace the priorities because we do not have grounding in knowledge. And the Prophet ﷺ also warned us of that when he said that towards the end of times, people will take as their leaders people who are ignorant. People who are ignorant will lead. This is warning from the Prophet ﷺ that if you, if you want to do that, couple that with an active routine of seeking beneficial knowledge seriously. Otherwise, brothers and sisters, what happens is we begin to fool ourselves into thinking that we know when we really don't know. And that's called compounded ignorance. Al-jahlul murakkab. It's one thing to be ignorant, but realize that one is ignorant. But it's another thing to be ignorant 
and be ignorant of the fact that one is ignorant. That's compounded ignorance. And that's very dangerous because that leads to arrogance. That leads to kibr. And I close with this, brothers and sisters, that alhamdulillah in this masjid, we have many opportunities for us to, to embark on this path of learning the deen seriously. We have classes in the Arabic language. And the Arabic language is the key to, appro to, to approaching the sacred texts directly. Without learning the Arabic language, there will always be a barrier between you and the Book of Allah. And the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You will always have to go through the medium of an interpreter. And then your understanding will be colored by that interpreter. We have classes that are structured, that are designed around your busy schedule for you to learn the Arabic language. And there are banners and flyers out there that give you more information about that. We have regular classes in the various sciences of Islam. We have a seminar tomorrow in the Hadith Sciences. And there's a banner out there for that. And periodically we do classes in other subjects as well. And we have recently started regular weekly classes in learning the art of Tajweed. Learning how to recite the Qur'an properly and correctly. And we gather together as adults, as brothers, after Fajr every Saturday, right here. And we make circles and we learn and we improve our recitation of the Qur'an. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to look for these opportunities and make time to attend these classes with seriousness, with some regularity. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspire and facilitate it for all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who tread this path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who remove this disease of ignorance from our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us to learn, to understand, and to implement. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك يا مولانا سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اشف مرضانا واشف مرضى المسلمين وارحم موتانا وارحم موت المسلمين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون قوموا إلى صلاتكم يرحمكم الله الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر <تصفيق>